Yes, back for another Tuesday. I'm Mike Scala. This is Nuance. And I'm joined by Jay Carter, our co-host, as well as the chair of BLM Tokyo. What's going on, Jay? Uh, how much? You know what it is. It's uh, another uh, morning, actually a Wednesday morning here, while well, it's Tuesday morning there. Tuesday so. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's the evening. Even though I can see in the back, it's, it's still daylight outside, which is kind of interesting. And of course, we should not forget, Jay is also known as Timid, the hip-hop artist extraordinaire. Yes, What's sir. going on with the hip-hop these days? Hip-hop these days, you know, um, I haven't listened to much new hip-hop these days, really. Well, we'll get into it. I want to introduce our very special guest. We have Adam Clayton Powell, who is a consultant, well-known in New York politics, former city council member and state assembly member. How are you, Adam? I'm good. I'm good. How are you, Mike? Very good. And Timmy. Yes, yes. Thank you for joining us. we got a lot to get into, but uh, we do like to start off. Yes, it's a Tuesday evening here in, uh, in New York. I'm in Harlem, but uh, it is daylight, um, you know, late June, early July to like 845. There you go. So, and, and as we speak, fireworks are playing out. So I don't know if you guys can hear it, but there are still fireworks going on in New York. Oh, really? Wow. That's that's interesting because like recently with fireworks, like I, I don't remember people complaining about it when I was younger. But these days during like uh, New Year's Eve or July 4th, there's a lot of people that start complaining about fireworks because they say it scares their pets. And now it's like, oh, you people are so crazy because you're shooting off fireworks and you're scaring my dog. Like, I don't remember that being a controversy when I was younger. Sure. They were always afraid. And people are becoming more and more sensitive these I days. So. Everything is a big deal. Right. But people always, I think, had that concern that their pets were afraid. But I think now people are just more conscious of stuff like that, right? They're more mindful of being kind to animals. I guess yeah. also... Also, now we have social media, they have a place to go and post about it, you know, and, and let people and say it to the world, like, hey, stop doing that. My dog is scared. Like, yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's it's July 4th. You, yeah. You, you know, you got to expect that that's going to happen. Put, dogs put dogs dog, will get used to it. Like, we all get used to it. Put your dog in, like, in the bathroom and close the door or something in a place where they won't hear it or something, because you Carry can't dog, stop it. It's fun. It's fireworks. There was an effort, in New York City, I, I guess there still is, to make it illegal for even displays to have fireworks that make noise. They want all quiet fireworks. How do you do yeah. that? How do you do quiet fireworks? <laughs> well, it's funny. they can, but it, some people say it defeats the purpose, right? Yeah, well, I guess sparklers. If everyone's just going to be doing sparklers like all night long, that'd be kind no, of. I, I do believe, I mean, I'm not an expert in fireworks, but I do believe that they have some way to do some kind of display that doesn't make noise or, or, it's, or it's quieter than usual uh, i i went to i went to the philippines uh, a few years back and i was in manila during um new year's eve and you want to talk about loud fireworks i swear to god it sounded like a war zone in manila like talking about the explosions just I was like jesus christ is that tnt it's got to be tnt mm. Mm. So, yeah, they yeah, eliminate fireworks, just another way of sanitizing society. <laughs> We're getting all yeah, vanilla, all vanilla, no flavors. So, yeah, we can't do that. Some people said it sounded like they were in Ukraine with the fireworks. Like it was, it looked like, to your Ukraine. point, Ukraine. Amazing. We're still talking about that five months later. Yeah. Yeah. It's still going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, you know what? This could be a topic, Jay, because we like to start off something on the light side. This isn't very light but it's something you know maybe lighter uh do people still say happy fourth of july i saw some controversy over that and someone even said now that we have juneteenth as a holiday we're gonna celebrate that and no longer independence day um i haven't heard that um you know why why don't why can't we do, do both they're both part of part of the history of the country you know um i don't see why we need to choose one or the other yeah, I agree. I mean, people want to celebrate, you know, one more than the other can do so. People want to do both can do both. I don't think you have to eliminate one to enhance the other. Right. Yeah, I agree. And for those who don't know, Adam, your grandfather was the first black congressman in New York history, correct? My father. Your father. My dad. Yeah. Yeah. First black New York City councilman and then first black congressman in New York State. And actually the second one from um, the United States after mm -hmm. Reconstruction. Wow. Yeah. 
Yeah, Reconstruction uh, um, had many African American black members of Congress, and then all that all that went away with Jim Crow. And then the '40s, you had uh, the fellow from uh, Chicago, Bill Dawson, 1942, and then two years later, my father. Wow, it's a lot of history there. And by the way, I need to correct myself uh, on on this topic. <laughs> Last week, I actually misspoke when I was asked about how many states it was required to ratify a constitutional amendment. I said three-fifths. It's really three-fourths. But the reason why I was thinking three-fifths is because when I think of the Constitution and fractions, I'm always thinking of that terrible three-fifths rule where they counted slaves as three-fifths yeah. persons. Yeah. But it's actually three-fourths of the states to ratify. Three-fourths of the states. Yeah, I believe that's uh, 38. That's 38, right? So it's even yeah, harder I think so. than, than it would be if it was three-fifths. Yeah. Very difficult, especially now, to get something like that done. Yeah. Yeah, that'd, that'd be crazy. So, and you don't have any, any like that, the, you know, the uh, partisanship is, is very, very difficult these days. Like, one could say the sky is blue, the other one can say it's not, and now you got to fight over it. Right, and that's the issue. It's that we're not just debating what the policy should be. We're working with two different sets of facts, or sometimes more than two sets of facts. And how right. could you come to any kind of common ground if you can't even agree on what's happening? Although I did see in the news this past week, there was something that apparently both sides seemed to agree on. Um, there was a purchase of a large amount of land in one of the Midwest states, and it was purchased by a Chinese company. But that land is, I don't know, like 10 miles down the road from a U.S. military base where they do a lot of, um, you know, secret, top secret things. And so both sides are upset about the purchase of trying to do something about it because they're saying that this is probably something from the Chinese government to try to intercept the signals that are coming out of that base. So you got, you got both sides that are like pushing to try to, to thwart this sale or do something mm -hmm. against it. So, hey, we've got some common ground on something. Yeah, right, sure. That's a yeah, it's amazing. It's just becoming very divided, you know, blue and red, it's just horrible. Right. I brought up that when Russia invaded Ukraine, that was also something that finally both sides seemed to agree on. Although you did have certain people in the fringes with their own opinions, which is always going to happen. At least you had majority support on the left and the right being against that invasion. Yeah, absolutely. So why don't we go over our poll results from last week since we're speaking numbers and what people think. This was one that was divided right down the middle, at least on mine. I think you had a similar result on yours, right? We asked whether lawful permanent residents should be given the right to vote in local elections. And the reason why we asked that was because a judge in Staten Island struck down the city council's ruling that lawful permanent residents could vote in municipal elections. So we thought people should weigh in on this. What do people think? And pretty evenly split. Yeah, um, I, ran it, I ran the poll in a couple of different places. Um, some places came out a little higher than others. Um, like on Twitter, it ended up being more, yes, they should be. Um, but in the various places I put it all together, it, Results came about 50 50 um, and ended up getting some comments as well. Um, some from permanent residents um, who, you know, say, um, you know, I, I, you know, shouldn't be allowed to vote. I've got it, should be a citizen. Some from others saying that, um, yeah, we pay, we pay taxes. The country's founded on taxation without representation. So if we're paying taxes, then they should be allowed, they should be allowed to, to vote in that. So, um, you know, very good responses, but it was about 50-50 on my end. What do you think, Adam? Look, the reality, we've always had um, non-citizens uh, mm -hmm. uh, voting, um, you know, legal residents voting. I mean, we've had, uh, New York City had school board elections up until a few years ago when mayoral control took over the school system, but school board elections had every parent, anybody who had a, a child in the public school system could vote, whether they were a citizen or not a citizen. And by the way, it also happens in other uh, cities uh, around the country, not many, but it's not a novel idea. I think that people who are paying taxes, like you said, who are here legally and who also are suffering or enjoying, you know, the quality of life or the benefits of, uh, you know, the city day-to-day um, -day administration ought to have a say in, in how that city is ran. Uh, we're not talking, you know, federal, we're not talking voting for president or for the Congress. But voting for city council members, sure. Voting for mayor, sure. 
I think they should be uh, entitled to that. And it's unfortunate that it's one judge, you know, maybe he's not the only one, but uh, unfortunately that one wrong judge that got the lawsuit in and rule against and obviously and, and i did hear now this is what bothers me the people who are against this obviously didn't bring the lawsuit in manhattan or the bronx or brooklyn they took the lawsuit all the way to staten island where they figure there might be some conservative right-wing judges that are you know they find the idea distasteful and sure enough unfortunately it got struck down but That's hopefully we can get over it hopefully there's other ways to, of doing this and implementing it, this so that 800,000 people who are here legally paying taxes can vote. That's a very good point that they brought this case in Staten Island, hoping to find a more conservative judge. And some Absolutely. people say, so how could one judge in Staten Island make a decision for the whole city? You know, it I is, know, right? I know. It is the state Supreme Court. So whether, whether it's in Staten Island or Queens or Manhattan. Yeah, it, it, will, it will be appealed, I hope. And, and hopefully the appeals will be won by uh, fair-minded people. And, and this whole notion that, oh, somehow if, uh, if people can vote, they're not going to want to uh, apply for citizenship, there's no incentive anymore, that's ludicrous. <laughs> you know, the reason to become citizen is not to vote. reason to become citizen is a whole lot of other things. First of all, you can't get deported <laughs> if you get into a fight at a bar. You know, the whole lot of host of reasons why people may want to become citizens. It's not just for voting. And unfortunately, most U.S. citizens do not even vote. So citizenship equals voting or voting equals citizenship, that's, that's ludicrous. That's not a, a fair argument. You know, again, um, the point is that these people, if they get allowed to vote, they are still going to want to become citizens. This will in no way, you know, uh, uh, detract them from, from that ideal. If they want to become citizens, they will. Yeah. It's... Yeah, there are a lot of benefits to citizenship. It's not just voting. Right. I mean, I think people associate voting and citizenship maybe above everything else, but you're right. right. It's only about voting. Yeah, it's, it's beyond voting. I say you get into a bar fight, if you're not a citizen, you might get out of here, deported. Even if you're a lawful person. Exactly. Yeah, simple as that. Correct. But if you're a citizen, obviously you're not going to get deported. Yeah. There are a whole lot of other things, benefits for citizenships. Yeah. So we, we did bring up last time the, that there's, um, as far as allowing non-citizens to vote, I think local elections is the key word here um, to, to separate it from things like president or, or Congress. Right. Um, because there are some, not only are there some benefits to citizenship, but there are some obligations as well. You know, uh, young men 18 to 25 are required to register for selective service, whereas permanent residents aren't. Who told Jay that they were? Maybe Adam can help us with this. That lawful permanent residents do have to register for selective service. You know, honestly, I I, I think I know, but I don't want to tell you what I think because I'm not 100 percent sure. <laughs> Let's let, I'll clarify that. But I'm, from what I was, what I understood is that they they some do, but they're not required to. They can volunteer for it, but they don't have to. But oh, we'll have to definitely clarify that. Yeah, why don't we look that up? Because yeah. someone actually texted me last week saying that they were required to. Interesting. Okay. Well, one, one small piece of history, and this happened over 100 years ago, but the reason why many believe that um, the United States government uh, gave Puerto Ricans uh, citizenship uh, by birth, and this happened in 1917, the Forker Act, um, the idea some people argue is that the United States wanted Puerto Ricans to serve in World War I. And that's why it conferred citizenship. So if so, then it, it follows that you have to be a citizen, but I don't know. Anyway, that was just speculation on what happened a hundred years ago, which by the way, the Congress in Puerto Rico unanimously voted against US citizenship so for whatever it's worth, <laughs> but it was still pushed down the throats of then the Puerto Ricans. And to this day, we are born US citizens. Right. What do you think about statehood? I think it has majority support in Puerto Rico now, doesn't it? No, it goes back and forth between statehood and the status quo. You know, they're both at about 50-50 or 40-40 with the other 20% all over the place. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a heavy issue. I don't think a 51% majority should should dominate that. I think it should be something more thorough and, 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 and um, you know, more overwhelming, if you will. Yeah. Um, 
But yeah, it's been debated since before I was born and probably will continue to be debated long after I leave. Right. So here, I, I pull it up and according to the, the, the government website, it says with very few exceptions, all immigrant males between 18 and 25 are required by law to register with select the service within 30 days of arriving in the United States. This includes naturalized citizens, parolees, undocumented immigrants, legal permanent residents, asylum seekers, refugees, and all males with visas more than 30 days expired. Wow, so, that's wow. everybody. Yeah, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Undocumented too. Yeah, wow. Don't fight for cool. us and after war we'll consider <laughs> supporting you or keeping you. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was also a controversy. Weren't there some who, who did fight for, or some residents who did fight for us, but then they got deported? Wasn't that during the Trump uh, presidency? Oh. Some, some veterans had gotten yeah. deported. Yeah, I heard something about yeah. that. Yeah. So I wanted to bring uh, up part of this lawsuit was about the issue of does the city law rule here or does the state law rule because the state election law does say that you have to be a citizen to vote this is a local law new york city law saying something different i talked about how while well, the state election law also has a provision saying that any conflicting provision of the law means you go to the new one not what's in the law so that has become a point of contention but a basic premise of this whole argument really is does state law trump city law normally yes so for, for those wondering, well, how come the city law is able to override a state law? Yeah, normally state law does override city law, but you get into a very, very difficult and messy area of law when you start talking about what's called the home rule doctrine. And Adam, you know all about this being in the city council and in the assembly. When you have the affairs of the city, the state constitution basically carves out the city's ability to speak on what happens in the city, but then you always have argument as to, to what extent that applies. It gets very messy, but the bottom line is- Yeah, and again, and again, that could apply, let's say again, if we're voting for a state governor or state assembly, state senate elections, but for city elections, uh, I just don't think it's applicable. And, and, and again, for 40 years, people are voting, non-citizens were voting in New York City for school board elections, so and nobody raised an eyebrow about that, nobody. Right, right. And so just for those who might've been confused, but well, how come a city law can override a state law that's why, right? There's the whole home. Yeah, and it's not over. Exactly. It's not overriding. It's just uh, one would deal with city elections. The state law deals with state elections. I see it that way. Right. But the state election law also governs what happens in city elections like it. But that's also controversial because, for example, the state law has a signature requirement for city council petitions, but the city charter has another number altogether. And the city board of elections uses the city's number, not the state's number. Wow. So. Yeah, it's a very it's a people section of the law, but mm -hmm. yeah, I know people might have been confused, like how come how come you have a state law and a city law in conflict, and how come the city law might be? Yeah, issue? it's it gets very messy. So, we'll see. Like Adam said, there's going to be appeals. Probably it's going to go yeah, I'll probably be appealed. We'll see. And even if the appeals are not successful, hopefully they can craft another piece of legislation that's more um, targeted to certain elections, certain specific requirements, and you know, allow everybody as many people as can vote to participate. Again, that's the way it was in school board elections for 40 years. A great segue because we want to talk about what New York has done in response to the Supreme Court striking down its gun law. It went back to the legislature and it came up with new legislation now in response. And a point of controversy here is when people are going to apply for gun licenses now to carry a gun outside the home, they can have to submit their social media accounts. Some people might think that's an overreach. What do you think about that? Well, if the purpose is to look into, you know, if you display any type of uh, anger or radical, uh, you know, tendencies, then then I think it's a good thing. Um, I, I I do believe that in New York City, um, you know, carrying a gun should be a very very difficult uh, bar to to. Uh, to overcome because of the density of the population, the, the, the numbers here are just uh, insane. The crime numbers, the statistics. So I think this is the, the last place that we wanna see people carrying guns. Unfortunately, Supreme Court decision made it easier for people to do so. So now they're also crafting part of the legislation besides the social media is um, crafting certain areas where are protected, like schools, like hospitals, you know, like uh, big concerts or sporting events where there is a conglomerate of too many people, subways, buses, and so on and so forth, so that hopefully, 
you know, there are very limited areas where people can just walk around with a gun in New York City. That's the end result. Hopefully that will be the end result. Right. And we mentioned last week how the Supreme Court did say you could have sensitive areas where you restrict sure. carrying a gun. But the question sure. then is, how far can you take that? I mean, if you're going to say you can carry a gun in public, but it can't be in basically any area you'd want to bring it, is that going too far? Is that going to survive scrutiny by the Supreme Court? We'll see. We'll see. I mean, right now you can at least walk down your street. <laughs> Just don't go to like, I think Times Square is actually also a uh, carved out so even those streets you cannot walk around with a gun i think i'm not sure so basically it's just that you can walk down the street but you cannot enter a lot of buildings um you yeah. know and that's for good reason so i don't know if that will pass muster with the supreme court but hopefully it will and hopefully fewer and fewer people will be carrying guns in new york city i think that uh, had of a uh, have someone like you mentioned if they make it uh like the subway is a restricted area and you can't go in there then i think people are going to argue then you know now you're restricting my movement. I can't go anywhere. You know, I'm supposed to. I'm supposed to be expected to walk from from Brooklyn to, to Harlem because yeah. I'm carrying a gun. Like, so yeah. I think there's some contention there. As far as the social media, well, technically, technically, you could catch a cab. Obviously, it's more money. But yeah, I, I don't think taxis are uh, part of the uh, protected areas. If I was a taxi driver, I don't know if I'd want someone <laughs> sitting in the back with a gun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but as far as social media requiring it. I look at it a little bit different. I think that's a little bit more performative because um, I, I get the idea. Yeah, you want to research the person. You want to see if they're talking to it. But what, what do you do if their social media is private? You know, people search. It is intrusive. Them. It is totally intrusive, no doubt. Yeah. What if it's private? What if they give you a, what if they give you an, a temporary account that they made? You can make a social media account like right now in five minutes. And here, this is my social media account. It is. Well, well no. So, so here's how I would do. And I think they look back. I don't, I don't know if it's two years or there's a certain number of, of time that you have to go back to say we want to see all of your accounts going back this amount of time. Now, you can tell them I don't have any accounts, but you'd be lying to them if, if that was the case, in which case, then if they found out, that would be reason to not give you the license, obviously, and get you in trouble. So I think it's let us know your social media accounts. And if they're private, I don't think it should go further than that. I don't think you should be required to make them not private, right? I think it's just be transparent. It's really, did you post anything on Twitter or anything that we can see that will show that you shouldn't have a gun? Yeah, but in, in that case, if the, if the purpose of it is to actually see if there's anything they posted, if it's private, I mean, I could go in and apply for the gun. And before I go in, turn my social media to all private and then give it to you and then like, you know, they can't look at anything like and in my Facebook, for example, is private. And so, you know, there's nothing they're going to see, even though it goes back 10 years. Um, I mean, I understand why they want to ask for it. Like you said, that, that research to see if there's any history there. But it's such an easy thing to get around that it just doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense to me. Unless you have people who are proud of what they write. I mean, maybe the type of people who would use it for these crazy reasons don't care who sees it. And they're like, you know, listen, I am who I am. And I, I'm making the statement to the world. Come and get me. You know, that, that's possible, too. Absolutely. I mean, if you at least have the foresight to make your social media private, maybe you are at least are a thinking person. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. So, no, it's but you're right. I, I do think that you run a risk there. Right. Like if we say, OK, we're going to demand your passwords. We're going to demand you make your social media public if it was private before. Now you're getting, I think, too intrusive. Right. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think to some, some uh, even in job searches, some uh, companies were asking for your social media accounts as well for, I guess, similar reasons. And it's like, you know, people are, again, like, this is none of your business. These are my private accounts, uh, which is a, a whole different ballgame with, with guns. I, I agree there, but I just think it's such an easy thing to get around that, yeah. It's very intrusive, without a doubt. But when it comes to owning a gun or, or carrying a gun, walking around the street, I'm all for all intrusive. <laughs> mm -hmm. At least in New York City. Yeah, New York City is definitely, uh, you know, there's not only is, like you said, people are on top of each other already. On top of each uh, other. There, There is just having that much... That many people around and that less a little bit of personal space there are going to be tensions that already arise and, and you want to you don't want to put a gun in the mix like one person like, like one person oh yeah yeah right so. 
And we're coming out of an era in New York City and, in, and really the whole state where it was hard to get that permit to carry outside your house. And so now the Supreme Court is striking that down and saying it's too burdensome. What do we do? We want to do all we can in our power to make sure we have strict rules in place. And we've talked yeah. about that. Yeah, and I don't know the exact numbers, but it's something like about 25 percent, maybe one in every four people who, who legally had a, a permit to have a gun in their house for protection, only about one in four had the ability to walk down the street, even their own street with it. Again, three out of four had to keep the gun at the home, you know, sort of thing. So that's what the Supreme Court decision made. It lifted that uh, burden. And now everybody that has a gun legally at home can also walk down the street with it legally. They still have to get a permit, though. I, mean, I want to make that clear. You still have to get a permit to have a gun at home. But if you do get it, you can walk the streets with it. So long as you don't go into a museum, a school, hospital, um, you know, the underground trains, uh, there's some public, oh, uh, parks, I believe are, are in there. So long as you don't go into the protected uh, uh, zones, you can walk down the street with a gun. So long as you have a right to have one at home. And that's what the Supreme Court decision uh, made a difference. A lot of people had the permits at home but only about 25% could take it out and walk around. Scary days. I think yep. should, everyone should get the, you know, get some cowboy hats and like a whole sure. and we can go back to the okay crowd days. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now that's crazy. I mean, the, the reality is just too many guns in the whole country. Forget New York, New York City, the entire country. You know, unfortunately, uh, people have twisted the Second Amendment to, 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 to mean what they want to hear, you know. When they built the Second Amendment into the Constitution, they were talking about pistols. You know, now you're talking about automatic Isn't weapons it? that can kill 100 people in, in 30 seconds, 20 seconds. Well, it's not even um, pre -pistol. The framers of the Constitution had in mind. So. I think it might have even been pre-pistol back then. Yeah, exactly. Pistol. Exactly. <laughs> and it was, you know, and it was obviously to defend yourself against... Uh, you know, they were still looking at the British or other countries who may want to come and invade this and that and the other, but not to do what we're doing, man. We've had 300, over 300 mass shootings this year, six months. Look what happened yesterday. It's just, yeah, you know, we've grown numb to it. It's just part of the daily routine. It's horrible. Yeah. And we ban, I mean, we ban assault uh, weapons, uh, we automatic or semi-automatic assault weapons in 1994. It was part of the Brady Bill. Congress banned it nationally. You couldn't have, a, a, again, a semi-automatic weapon. But unfortunately, they, they, they passed the law with a 10-year sunset. Now, I don't know what the idea was, what they wanted to do after 10 years, but obviously they did nothing in the law sunset. And after 10 years in 2004, bingo, everybody can have a semi-automatic weapon again. Yeah, I think it came up when, uh, during Bush's term and they didn't renew it. Um, they didn't renew it. I don't Republican know why I had a sunset. Said, Republicans I guess that was the only majority. way to get it passed. It could have been. Um, and yeah. I think I think that should be something that people point to as far as when people are having these fears, like, oh, they're, they're doing this to control us, they're doing this to that. Well, we did it for 10 years and no one had, there was no issues. No, no one came issue. and stormed no your issues. house. Yeah. Yeah. Again, the Second Amendment, you know, it's firearms. It doesn't talk about bazookas and grenades and automatic weapons. It's yeah. firearms. <laughs> And it says well regulated, right? It's yeah. right there in the beginning of the amendment. So for yeah. people who say that any restriction on guns is anti Second Amendment, no, that's pro Second. No. If you're for right. Second Amendment, you want well regulation. Yep. Right. Absolutely. Well, I guess since we talked about social media, there is that question of is New York becoming a nanny state? And we're seeing that with the 24 7. Speed cameras. Of course, we had speed cameras in effect in school zones between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. The idea being that's when children would be around who were going to school or leaving school. But now there's a new state law that authorized 24-7 speed cameras. And in August, we're gonna, gonna get them in New York City. So there's an information campaign going on now to educate people on this. Do we think it's a good idea? Is that an overreach? A lot of people complain that in their view, this is just a way to punish drivers. The money maker. More money, more money. I mean, at two o'clock in the morning, somebody's speeding through a school zone, a school zone. Come on, give me a break. Now, speeding in general, obviously, is wrong. 
but school zones and other areas, I mean, That's a great it question, shouldn't be 24 right? hours. It's a school zone at two o'clock in the morning. It o'clock. shouldn't be 24 hours, but it's a moneymaker. You know, you're going to get and caught see, at two, three, four in the morning. That's that's my issue with with that, and even some of the the ticketing and all, all that in general is that I don't think these things should be seen as uh, revenue that the city relies on. Right, they're supposed to be to make sure that you know we have an orderly society. They shouldn't be something that you rely on in your budget yep. item because then what it does yep. is it forces the system to try to go after people to to make sure they reach a certain money because okay, well we need to fill this budget item. And having 24-7 cameras, it's like, okay, we're just trying to catch everybody. You want to, like you said, it's a money thing. And it's like, that's, that's not a good way to live. Yeah, it's not, it's not good policy. Yeah. Well, on the flip side, people will say. But again, the nanny state has been created, you know, years ago. I mean, everybody's trying to sanitize, you know, society, sanitize New York City. Like we were talking before about the fireworks. Now, uh, a thing about silent fireworks. I mean, come on. The liquor licenses, you can't get a 4 a.m. liquor license anymore. You know, back in the day we were growing up, just about all the bars and pubs were open till 4 in the morning. Nowadays, try finding one. Even on a Friday, Saturday, not easy because they're trying to sanitize society. It's funny, it's, it's, um, the nanny state and the sanitized society, like, um, that's also uh, a, a phrase and a, a talking point that's also used on conservative sides um so there's again there's some cons- there is some common ground between everybody that, that looks at, at how the country is moving and you know and not happy with it and i think we should push but there are push a lot of people point. who will say that first of all you shouldn't speed second of all with the whole vision zero they looked at the speed rates and they said that if you're going 25 miles an hour you're much less likely to kill someone if you hit them than if you're going 35 40 miles an hour and so shouldn't we do all we can to prevent people from speeding that you really and the speed cameras only are supposed to kick in if you go over 10 miles an hour over the speed limit so if you're going over 35 miles an hour they, they, they would say shouldn't you get a ticket at any, any time of the day but is it also is it is it only kicking in then, or is it still s- surveilling people? See, that's another thing I'm, I'm not, you know, really happy with it. If it's constantly sur- constant surveillance, with the surveillance, maybe the camera takes the picture, the freeze frame, once it goes over 10 miles an hour, but it's constantly surveilling uh, the, the movement. Uh, that's what I'm wondering. So, well, I mean, that's interesting distinction. So you're more concerned about the camera just being there and watching people than ticketing them for going too fast. This, yeah, the surveillance, the whole, you know, surveillance of society in that regard is should be uncomfortable, I think, to, to many people. Yeah, absolutely. I think so. I think that's a good point. And, you know, I think a lot of these things are situational. Sometimes you have to go faster for whatever reason. Should you automatically get a ticket in the mail? What if you're rushing to the hospital? What if you have someone pregnant in the car? You know, what, what if you have people tailgating you and you have to get past them? Whatever it is. I All mean, right. that's why we had people who were police officers or, or people who knew what they were doing in, in theory, looking at this as opposed to right. giving it to robots. And right. there were actually speed cameras in other jurisdictions that were deemed unconstitutional because they were actually given to private companies. And they said the private companies had an incentive to give out more tickets because they made more money that way. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, and again, the uh, traffic in New York City, because of the density of this city, you can never really speed too much. I mean, you know, maybe it's sometimes some places, but it's not like other parts of the uh, states or country where you can speed everywhere any time because the roads are more open, not here. You guys, oh. you're lucky if you can move over 10 miles an hour, even if you oh, want four to. In a, well, four a.m. in a school zone. There are areas, though, where it goes from residential, where it's kind of obvious where you should be driving slow, mm-hmm. to more open very quickly. And I would argue those are speed traps. Where yeah. Traps. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I, yeah, we shouldn't be trying to trap our citizens into, yep. you know, fees and fines and, and things. Yep. Like, I just, you know. And do you think that some of that is done to punish drivers and frustrate them out of their vehicles? Because I've heard this too, that there is a goal out there in the city to get people to take more mass transit because they're afraid of, you know, obviously pollution coming from cars, but instead of making it more appealing to take mass transit, they're trying to punish people and just make people too frustrated to drive. 
Yeah, that, that makes sense because there's definitely a movement to do that through a whole variety of things. You know, the bike lanes, the, uh, I mean, now they're going to put, put a toll on, on driving uh, below 96th Street uh, in Manhattan or coming into Midtown from uh, the outer bars, quote unquote. So, yeah, there's a movement afoot to do that, to discourage driving. And I think also, like like Adam said, it's a it's it's a money thing. We put up these cameras, we can catch more people, um, and it's just automated, and we've got a new source of revenue. Yep, easy money, right? And when it comes to that congestion pricing, I've always had a problem with it because here in my part of Queens, we've always fought the toll on the Cross Bay Bridge. And we said that it wasn't fair to toll drivers, to charge us to drive from Queens to Queens. It was the only intra-borough toll in the whole city. And wow. now to say you have to pay a toll to drive within Manhattan, I don't think that's right. I would rather tax, for example, the East River crossings if you're going to do that. You know, put if you have to, put one on the Williamsburg Bridge or the East, you know, the the uh, Fifth Ninth Street Bridge or whatever it is. But to drive within Manhattan or drive from Queens to Queens, I don't think that's fair. Yeah, no, there's a movement afoot. Listen, you, you, you're uptown Manhattan, you drive below 96th Street, bingo, you will get a, a, a surcharge. That's Come from Queens, from the Bronx, from Brooklyn. This already, by the way, this already started a couple of years ago, maybe a year and a half, a couple of years, three years, whatever, recently, that when you're in a taxi, whether it be a yellow taxi, an Uber taxi, whatever taxi, you go below 96th Street, bingo, there's a surcharge. It's already there. <laughs> That's crazy to me that, I mean, it's the same city. Like I live, I live on 118th and 1st. And if any time I take the Uber to the train on 2nd Avenue 96, I make sure to put the address between 97th and 96. <laughs> Cause I know, and then I'll cross the street myself. Cause I know if he crosses, bingo, there's a surcharge there. I, I, got, I got caught with something like that. Cause I used yeah. to live in, in Valley Stream. Mm -hmm. And so when I would fly in, fly back to New York after going somewhere, you know, I come in the JFK and I would take a taxi from JFK to uh, Valley Stream. So of course, JFK is, you know, part of the, the city, whereas, you know, Valley Stream is technically Long Island, even though it's right there on the border. And so the charge would change going from, from uh, the airport, once it crossed over in the Valley Stream, then the pricing would flip into Long Island pricing. Right. So yeah, I've seen that happen. Yeah, yeah, that's always been there for yellow caps. Yep, yep. But now yeah. there's additional more surcharges, more of a money maker. It's, it's, it's crazy. Strange. And you can't drive anywhere in Manhattan anymore if you try. I mean, it was always difficult, but now they're making it prohibitively difficult and more and more difficult. Yeah. And just today they reinstituted the uh, the alternate side of the street parking. They had it during the pandemic, but they um, they curtailed it. By, by only having a one day a week alternate side of the street parking during the two year pandemic. Just today, it began like the three, four days, the normal. Right. It's interesting, they said when it was only one day a week for the two years of the pandemic, there were people that were leaving the car there for two, three weeks. I mean, if you're going on vacation, you figure $65 a week, it's a good parking fee. Because that's what yeah. they take it cost, $65 if you do not move it during the alternate side. And people leave their cars a couple of weeks and come back with two tickets on $30 and be happy with it. They won't do that because now you'll come back in two weeks with like eight tickets. Wow. That started today again. Another moneymaker. <laughs> right. And also people try to toll car, I mean, uh, tow cars who are there too long. You see that with the community boards and these community groups. People will yep. complain, this car has been parked on my block for four weeks. Can we get it towed? Yep. Yeah. I want to put the question out there because every week we put a poll question out to the people. So we asked about the speed cameras. I guess that's a good question to put to the audience. So the question for the week is, do you agree that New York City speed cameras should be active 24 hours a day, seven days a week? Yeah. See what response we get on that one. Yeah, well, I think a lot of people are frustrated with this whole idea of the nanny state. But it's it's you know you get people who say then that if you're not doing anything wrong, why worry, right? Oh, there's a lot to worry about in that regard, especially yeah. in that yeah. effect. You talk about biases, yeah, you gonna... talk about discrimination, you talk about uh, budgets and people wanting to make money. Like yeah, yeah. Even if you don't speak, you don't want people checking on you over your shoulder all the time. Yeah. I mean, look, look, they already got us on our iPhones. 
They know our every movement on our iPhones, for real, all the smartphones. I don't think people are happy about that. No, no we it doesn't don't. mean we're doing anything wrong. It's just, it's just the whole surveillance. Yeah. No, it is, and I definitely agree with that, and I share those concerns, but I also wonder how important are all of us? I mean, you know, sometimes we have an inflated sense of ego. It's like, do they really care about what most people are doing speed-wise? Like, they'll give you a ticket, sure, but do they care enough about you to want to look at you and, and track your every move? It's, it's not that there's someone specifically looking at you. It's, it's that the data is there, and anytime that, that something comes up or they want to, they can go through that. Maybe they're looking, maybe they're looking for someone else and they're looking for who's been in this area and now they're going through your data as well and now you're caught into something you know to that that was about someone else um and just like technically like do you do you think people should be tracked if they're going from their house to their, their garbage can like that should be on record somewhere but it, with the state or the city like i mean no i don't i don't think so but then the question is if we could somehow regulate that hypothetically if that wasn't we well, but let's just say hypothetically, like, because I'm trying to get, I guess, to the bottom of the concern here. If we could say that your data isn't tracked, it's only going to be used to give people a ticket. Would that be something you would support? Or does the concern kick in when it comes to them doing things beyond the ticket? Uh, well, the concern beyond the ticket, of course, but even just tracked in general, like, are we, are we all suspects of something? Like, should that be how we treat our, you know, our citizens, society, that we're potential suspects of something? Like, I, you know, I think it's just a, not a great way to live, not a great way to view our citizens. We shouldn't, it shouldn't have this, like, adversarial type relationship, in my opinion. Yeah, that's a good point. We shouldn't all be guilty until proven innocent. Right. You know what I mean? We should not, we should not feel like, guilty until proven innocent. Right. That's like, kind of like almost like a due process type thing where if you see right. the camera, it's almost like you're being accused by that camera, even if you're right. not. Yeah. yeah, we should be able to walk around freely. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, right? Yeah. So you brought, you did bring up um, the, the um, environmental impact of trying to cut the potential of cutting down. Uh, so you, you did have something that we were going to talk about in regards to the EPA. With the social, right. uh, and it's another Supreme Court decision that's obviously very controversial. We talked about several of them on the show already, but the latest one to come out in a 6-3 decision, the Supreme Court uh, cut back on the EPA's ability to regulate carbon emissions. Now, this goes back to the Obama administration. They gave the EPA a lot of authority to do that, to try to fight climate change. Trump then came in and undid it. There was a circuit court then who struck down what Trump did, and now the Supreme Court is striking down the uh, Obama regulation. Basically, the idea here is, should Congress have to pass a law to give the EPA or any agency that kind of authority, or can the agency just assert its authority but from the president or from the executive branch? And the Supreme Court uses major questions doctrine, which is really a new doctrine in Supreme Court jurisprudence, the major questions doctrine, where they're saying any major question, any issue of extreme national significance, major national importance has to be congressional. You have to have congressional approval. It can't just come from an agency. It can't come from the executive branch, the executive order, but Congress has to speak if it's an issue of major national importance. And this obviously has wide reaching implications. Number one, it stifles our ability to fight climate change. But even if you think beyond just this case, what it, does this mean when it comes to anything being able to get done really at the federal governmental level. I mean, there's so much gridlock in Washington now. Obviously, this current administration has used a lot of executive orders as has the previous one because of that gridlock. Now with this, it seems on any major issue with, with great impact, only Congress is gonna be able to act. Meaning if Congress is gridlocked, nothing can get done. And that's the end result. That's the sad part. I mean, I understand all the legalese and, and you broke it down really nicely, but it's not just taking the powers away from the government agencies and the president and giving it to Congress. It's not just that. It's just the, uh, you know, the common sense approach to some of these things. I mean, I want a clean environment as clean as can be. You know what I mean? So I don't know why anybody would fight that. <laughs> I think it's, it's a lot of the conservative side has this 
and they've been doing it for years of this visceral reaction to the, the idea of climate change and uh, global warming, like to yeah. be so anti that they yeah. don't think about anything else. So it's like they want to re reverse all these things. But, mm -hmm. you know, no one remembers in the in the 80s. I guess they don't remember in the 80s when like it was always on the news that the smog in L.A. was so incredibly thick that it was very hazardous. Right. Couldn't see through it, even though the yep. pollution, air pollution in New York was was yep. crazy. Like that wasn't even issues of climate change. That was because yeah. it was the Hudson deep. River. Yeah. If you remember the Hudson River, which separates New York and New Jersey, especially the Manhattan area in New Jersey, Hudson River was brown back in the eighties. Brown. Yeah, it's it was. Now it over was, the last twenty years, regained some color of our yeah. red color, river color. That was like a that was like a a, a national a, a joke that people would always talk about in movies and stuff about how dirty the Hudson River was. Brown. Like I think, yeah. I think they're forgetting that there yep. were some significant environmental pollution problems that we had that these regulations helped clean up so that people have this cleaner air and, and environment that we've got today. Well, yep. Justice Elena Kagan wrote for the dissent in this case, and she had a good quote. She said the majority does not have a clue about how to address climate change, yet mm -hmm. it appoints itself, instead of Congress or the expert agency, the mm -hmm. decision maker on climate policy. I cannot think of many things more frightening, she said. Yeah, exactly. All the legalese. And the bottom line is that climate change uh, will get worse. Right. And right. my question on this is, if you're going to require Congress to act on any major decisions, then wouldn't that apply to military authorization? We're seeing... The presidents always bypass Congress. Really, Congress obviously declares war, but the president has been sending troops to war even without the declaration of war, just been really effectively bringing us to war. Isn't that a major decision? Isn't that a major question? If you're going to do this for climate change, should you turn around and say you need congressional approval to go to war? I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and they could say, well, he's not, he's not declaring war. He's just sending troops over there. Well, yeah, you send troops and tanks and all this over to another place, that's going to lead to war. It's just, uh, you know. It's an issue of major national significance. And also the economy was mentioned in this case. It has to be transformative to the economy. I can't think of many things more transformative to the economy than going to war. <laughs> Absolutely. But this Supreme Court has become so politicized that I bet you if it's a Republican president going to war, they'll say it's okay. If the Democratic president going to war, they'll say, oh, no, 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 Congress has to declare war. It's that's just right. a political Supreme Court, and that's the sad part. That's right. That's also when it comes to someone not born in the U.S. running for president, right? Like, like Ted Cruz, for example. They can say, well, he was born a U.S. citizen, but if that was a Democrat doing that, they might have not allowed it. Right. Well, they did the same thing. They, they kept going after Obama, claiming that he was not, you know, a U.S. citizen. Uh, but Ted Cruz was clearly born outside of the U.S. And so, like, there was no issue with that. Even, Obama... thing, even with Obama, even if he wasn't born in the U.S., he was still would be born a U.S. citizen, so he still would be able to run for president the same way Ted Cruz could, right? Right. But they made that, they made that a whole platform issue. Like, that was a big movement. And so it, it's... Yeah, there's this a lot of that's insanity. the point. I think it, you know, and, and we're right to be cynical about this. Sure, it has become so politicized that we predict it depends on who the person is, we, what the issue is, and what the makeup of the court is. It's a conservative supermajority right now. Any issue that's favored by the left, or if if it was a person running for office on the left, we would think would have their back against the wall of this court. Hundred mm -hmm. percent. Right. Yeah. And again, like we spoke on this on another um, episode when we talked about Supreme Court. To me, that that calls into question the, those justices' ability to serve on the court because they don't have that impartiality. They're going in with an agenda, and that's not what a judge is supposed to be in that position to do, especially not one on the Supreme Court. Right, and there are people, I think it was brought up on our show once before, people saying that those justices could be prosecuted for perjury even because they went before Congress and said Roe v. Wade was president. They weren't going to overturn it. And look what happened. I agree. They should be. Not prosecuted, but impeached. impeached. Well, yeah, prosecuted with an impeachment. Yes. Yeah. If they and lie, that's impeachable offense. And I think, unfortunately, I think we're just getting started in that regard. Um, 
because what just in this past two weeks look what look at all that they've they've done like the epa thing the gun stuff the roe v wade you know and they're, they're going for all the things the gop has wanted for decades even though the country didn't want it but they're turning it to you know their special interest thing and they've got judges who got the majority that are going to do it so now they're emboldened they're going after just about a whole lot of other stuff that's been yeah yeah you know supposedly already adjudicated 20 30 years ago they're emboldened yeah the voting rights act before that they went after voting that. rights act marriage you equality know, i mean anything equality. that stems from a, a constitutional right yeah even you know see that that was a discussion that um i've Especially had often process. whereas the republicans and the g that that conservative side they're playing the long game right they they're they're you know i think liberals go for something short term and whatnot they're like no we're going to get judges on the courts we're going to yep. have people that's got appointments so our influence is going to last for the next 30 plus years yep. you know um think about um citizens united you know this is something that is a long game type of thing you know and, mm -hmm. and they can wait they can wait a little bit on it yeah because these are long game type of plans. That's why it's so important people understand the consequences of voting and elections. Yep. All people say, oh, it's time to shake things up. It's time for a change. You really got to think about what you're doing. If you're voting a certain way, it's not just about the next election. It's not mm -hmm. about a change for the next two years or four years. It could be the next 30 years, 50 years. Your whole life could change based on who gets on the courts and what happens from a policy perspective as a result of your actions. It's not just a, a short term game. Like you said, it's a very long term thing. Right. Maybe we should adopt. Um, we should get out there and push more. And I remember in the in, when we had Sam Cook on the show, uh, her outlook on the plans that she was doing was that she said she had a, a 500 year plan mm -hmm. or something like that. And the idea behind it was whatever action she's doing is how it's going to affect the future, you know, going that far ahead. And so you're thinking you're not thinking short term, you're thinking about legacy, you're thinking about lasting um, change and, and action. I think that's a really good uh, way of looking at some things. Think about the world you're going to leave behind. Think about your children. Think about your grandchildren. Life Absolutely. is for all of us, but to me at least, it's kind of meaningless if we only think about our short time on this earth. I want to think about the kind of world we're all leaving behind to the next generation. Absolutely. So... We have some good discussions here. Any closing thoughts before we wrap up? Well, we want to do, we also want to get into Adam and uh, what Adam's into and, and you know, what about what's going on? Man, I'm just a tenant trying to pay rent. That's about it, bro. It's the fifth of the month. I haven't paid my rent yet. So that's all I'm worried about. <laughs> now I've just, uh, you know, been doing some consulting, uh, working with clients, uh, doing liquor licenses for restaurants, uh, you know, bars, anybody else who, who may use or may need one. Uh, last year, I was very involved in the campaign for mayor, supporter Eric Adams. You know, I've been friends a long time. He asked me to help him. We got together. We sat down, just the two of us. And the rest is history. I was there front and center um, for no pay. I was volunteering. And uh, and I'm in the inner circle. I'm not in the administration. I Again, I'm in private practice. But I'm looking forward to the next three and a half years on the Eric Adams. I think it will be exciting. And uh and I'm still, you know, again, somewhat um, active in, in political issues and government issues as well. There's a lot to say about the mayor. Uh, what do you think his top priority really is in this term? Public safety. And that's why I think people, many people voted for him because he was a cop for 22 years. And crime is uh, beginning to spike up a little bit. It's not out of control. Like uh, people think, you know, the media will, will obviously show the worst crime of the day on the 11 o'clock, 6 o'clock news. But it is going back up. Like if crime was decreasing for 30 years, since the early 90s, all the way to like 2017, 2018. The first, Bill de Blasio has made eight years. The first six years of Bill de Blasio, crime decreased, just like in the, it did on this predecessor of Bloomberg and whatnot. But the last couple of years, it started to uptick a little bit. And it's a national phenomenon. It's not New York City. People have attributed that to the pandemic, to this, that, and the other, many factors. The bottom line is a national phenomena. But, you know, people in New York City don't want to hear about the national phenomena. They want to know how we're going to curtail crime and bring the numbers down again. And I think that's the biggest uh, challenge for Mayor Eric Adams. 
Wait, what, right. do, what would you say? What's your opinion on, on that? What do you think is attributing to that uptick um, um, nationally and in New York? Yeah, it's, it's hard to say, but apparently the pandemic, uh, you know, two years kind of like uh, brought that criminal element back outside with gusto, with sort of like uh, some sense of um, confidence, I guess. And once it starts to go up, it's hard to bring it back down again. But, uh, you know, I don't know what it is, but, it, but it's, still, it's still New York City. I mean, there are 9 million people here. We're never going to have a crime-free society. That's just not going to happen. We do have one of the safest uh, cities in the United States. Used to be the number one in terms of numbers, the safest city maybe still are, still is. But the bottom line is. Oh, looks like we, we lost him. Ah, he was right in the middle of some good stuff. getting good. The bottom line is. Yeah, the bottom. <laughs> they're going to say, they're going to say that he was cut off. This is a deep state. They didn't want him to speak. This is they the off. In effect, you see, we warned you. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes those things happen. But uh, James in the chat says, Ubers are expensive. I took an Uber from Rockaway to my doctor at NYU in Manhattan and back, and it was $150 each way. See, I, I never understood, like, I've been out here since the Uber phenomenon, and I never, so I never really understood the whole Uber thing, Uber Lyft thing, because it's, uh, aren't they more expensive than the regular taxis? Yeah. <laughs> like I never understood why people would do that because you could just call the taxi company and they'd come to the house and it's cheaper, you know. Than... Depends on where you are too, though, and the availability of the drivers and whatnot. Yeah, I I get, but it's just more expensive. I never, I would have always gone with the taxi option because it was cheaper. Now, I, if if they wouldn't come to certain areas or whatnot, I could see that. But just oh, I think but... it became kind of a status thing. It came yeah, kind of a. A lot of people also just like using the app. Uh, maybe taxis should do more of that, but people just like doing everything, just you know, pressing a few buttons on their app now, as opposed to having to call a taxi dispatcher. Well, there's a, there's an app out here that basically um, does that, and it's for the taxis um, for places that have. Well, when I was in I was in Hiroshima for a year, um, and there's a there's a, an app called DD Taxi, and it's basically the regular taxis, and you can do it on app, and it shows them the same thing. It shows where they are in the map and, and all like that. They just they just connected it to the taxi service. So maybe, right. yeah, the taxi needs to, to step their game up. And, and I think Bill Maher's last special, he made some predictions about the future, and he said that he thinks that in the future we'll stop being amateur taxi drivers. Uh, you think Uber and, and Lyft is going to go away? That's what he said in his special. Well, there was in the last couple of weeks, there was an article that came out and it's showing that they're just, they're, they're failing. They're not profitable. They're not, you know, um, it's not working. And they're also working with the taxi companies now in some cases. Right. right. Is that Adam back? Hey, man. Yeah. Sorry about that. Well, you're right. Said, you said the bottom line is, and you cut off. <laughs> yeah. My phone died. It, it, I didn't oh. realize it was going to, you know, take so much uh, energy on the, uh, you know, the Zoom call. Gotcha. Yeah. But I'm charging it again. Hopefully I'm good. I know we're leaving, but uh, but yeah. anyway, thank you, man. Uh, this has been a great, great pleasure. Uh, you know, great conversation on some very important topics. Very yeah, important. thank you for joining us. But we all need to know now, what is the bottom line? What was the question, Jay? It was about it was the bottom line on, on, on... And you mentioned the pandemic your... playing a role in that. Yeah, the pandemic playing a role in the uptick or, or different things in the uptick of crime. And you said the bottom line is we're waiting. Oh. What's the bottom line? Yeah, you cannot you we cannot have a crime-free society. I mean, but granted, every crime is one too many. So we have to at least, you know, reach for that crime-free society. It'll never happen. This is a big city and nine million people. So hopefully we can, you know, reduce the numbers to what they were pre-pandemic and keep going down with it. Um, you know, we'll be all right. Yeah, I think it's a good uh, a good thing. Um, I think also that we, in those efforts to do that, we also have to make sure that um, the citizens, respecting the citizens and their rights is is the top priority within yes. that, that movement. That's right. Yeah. Right. That's always the balancing act, but it's an important one. You know, yeah. who said that if you sacrifice so it security for, for freedom for security, you deserve neither? Right, right. It's, it's often attributed to either Edison or Franklin or something. It might be Benjamin Franklin. Yeah, 
yeah, maybe Franklin. It's often, I don't know if it's what he said, but it's often attributed to him. Yeah. Right. So, but so. appreciate you, you joining us. Um, it was great. Uh, definitely good conversation. Yeah, man, likewise. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for everyone for tuning in and we'll catch you next time. All right. All right, man. Thank you. All right. All right.